Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. Over the past few weeks, there's been a lot of discussion about this idea of the indie apocalypse or indie ocalypse or whatever you want to call it. The notion that there are simply too many games now, and as a result, Steam is massively oversaturated, and as a result, the likelihood of you becoming a success with your game on Steam is getting progressively lower and lower. The result of that, of course, is that you could have something of an extinction event. A lot of indie studios shutting down because there simply isn't enough money to go around. There's been plenty of discussion on this topic in a wide variety of different ways. It's spurred a great deal of developer blogs on Gama Sutra, which is maybe the best place to actually find that sort of information. Lots of indies write on Gama Sutra, and as a result, you've got things like the secrets to scrappiness, fighting to survive as an indie studio, what makes an indie hit, how to choose the right design, how to pitch your game, we've been doing it the wrong way, the sky is falling, everybody panic, on and on and on and on and on. They're all really, really good. I'm not saying that this stuff is repetitive and not useful. It's actually great. I love reading this stuff and I read it on a daily basis. What I'd like to do is try to add a little bit to the conversation from the perspective of content creator. And the way that I'm going to do that is by looking back through the history of games that I've done through WTF is. I'm not going to bother with 15 minutes of game because there's not a lot of decision making that goes into which titles get covered in that. But WTF is in particular, especially lately, has been a lot more selective and it will continue to be so. And as a result... I have to explain exactly why I chose each game, because maybe that will provide some insight to both you as the viewer and to developers. I also want to talk a little bit about the perspective of Chris, who is my PR guy and wearer of many hats, and he's given me some information on what he thinks is a good way to contact a YouTuber, in our case, us, and a bad way to do it. So maybe that'll be a little bit of useful advice and hopefully a little bit interesting. So let's have a look at some content, shall we? We'll start with Train Valley. That was the video that I put up yesterday. Why did I choose Train Valley exactly? You know, what put it on my radar? Well, I can tell you for a fact that the awareness of Train Valley was enhanced significantly due to the emails of a fellow called Simon Callahan. He works for the Johnny Atom PR company, and he'd emailed about Train Valley several times. The first one that I got from him, I think, was on May the 8th, and that was about it going into early access. I ignored that completely because I don't care about early access games. We then had another email saying that it was going to be released on September the 16th. There was another email saying it was out today, and then another one that came with review code. That's an example of a PR guy doing his job well. And Simon in particular is somebody that seems to know what the hell he's doing. Now, why do I say that? Well, if I look back through the number of emails that I've got from Simon, there are 104, I believe. And they go all the way back to 2012. And he's pretty good at getting stuff on our radar, honestly. He's done PR for Magicka Wizard Wars, War of the Vikings, Pillars of Eternity, City Skylines, Magicka 2, obviously Train Valley, as I mentioned there, and a few other titles. Now, I haven't covered all of the games that he's been pushing, absolutely not. I mean, I can't do that. That never happens. But Simon actually has a pretty high success rate with getting stuff onto my channel one way or the other. What's the trick, exactly? Well, the one that I can identify is the clarity of his email titles. That seems like such a small thing, but more often than not, it starts off with the name of the game, and it then uses the term review codes. You, you have no idea how ridiculously important that actually is. It, it's surprising, perhaps, to many people to hear that, but seriously, it's a great way of getting people to care if they happen to be looking to produce video content that day because it's nice and easy. It says review codes. Here's a review code right here. This is exactly what this email contains. Nothing else. And then I'll go into that, click it, and I'll see some more information about what it is. Maybe there'll be some trailers and all that sort of thing. So if there's any chance of getting me to do something on the spur of the moment, that's a great way to do it. We're not really interested in press releases. We get so many games on a daily basis, the last thing we really care about is, yeah, we have a new trailer out. What's nice is actually he tags the trailers at the start of the email, so I never open them. All of these trailer emails that I got from him, I never touch them. 
And that's actually quite refreshing because a lot of developers do email that sort of thing to us and we ignore it. We absolutely do because we don't care about the trailer. We don't care about some feature you've announced. And I think continuing to send that sort of information to a channel like ours shows that the PR person in general doesn't know what we do. Uh, they don't have any idea what we do. They're just firing out an email blast to as many people as possible. You know, interestingly enough, I don't know if this is a coincidence or not, but the vast majority of stuff that's been sent to me by Simon over the past few years has sort of been somewhere in my wheelhouse. It's not been something that I would completely hate. It's always going to be something at least somewhat related to me. Like, I'm, I'm not finding sports games in there. I'm not finding sort of weird experimental stuff like kind of walking simulators, the kind of stuff that I'm not really all that interested in. It's a lot of strategy. It's a lot of RPG, a little bit of management here and there, that sort of thing, the kind of thing that actually I would be interested in. I don't know if that's a coincidence. It may very well just be a coincidence that might just be the sort of games that he happens to rep, but there is a surprising number of titles that would probably interest our audience in particular as the sort of more core PC gamer demographic. Now, if you're a developer, of course, it can be very difficult to figure out exactly who to send codes to. There are a lot of YouTubers and most of them probably won't cover you. That's just the way that it works. But if you do take some time to do a little bit of research instead of just firing stuff out to everybody, then I think you'll find a higher success rate. We get plenty of emails from PR firms that are promoting things like mobile titles. In the worst case scenario, it's not even a PC port of a mobile title, it's literally just a mobile game. Now, this is absolutely worthless to us. We will not give it a second look. Of course not. We're a PC gaming channel. We have no interest in an iOS title. We have no interest in console games. This is the sort of thing that anyone that spent five minutes doing a little bit of research on who they were sending to would absolutely know. And there are quite a few PR firms that just don't seem to really get that. So the first piece of advice that I would give is certainly do what Simon is doing. It's a much, much more effective way of getting our attention. Front load it with information we want to know. Name of the game, genre, and review code in the email title, preferably, so that I actually have a chance of even clicking on that email in the first place. Don't try to obfuscate. Don't be ridiculous. Just be straight up about what it is and let me know that I can play it immediately if I so desire. Now, the reason I bring this up is because this is the reason why I played Train Valley, uh, the multiple emails that got sent in our general direction from Simon. And that was combined with my interest in the idea of transport management games. I'm terrible at those sort of games, but I love them anyway. Open TTD is one of my favorite games of all time. So if I see anything like that, then I will have more interest perhaps than I would in something that was not that genre. This isn't really something that an indie game developer can help. You know, if they've started developing a platformer, then they're not going to change it into some sort of real-time strategy or the kind of management game that I'd be interested in halfway down the line. That's insane. That's ridiculous. But in this case, Train Valley was covered because I took a look at it, thought, okay, I like Transport Tycoon Deluxe. Maybe I should have a shot at this. And also, intriguingly enough, the reason that I went through with it was due to Steam reviews. Now again, this is not something that's really inside the control of the developer. This video is not purely advice. It's just to try and give you an insight into my thought process. When I went to the Train Valley Steam page, the top rated review was negative. And I read that review. And I was intrigued because I thought, hmm, interesting. My initial impression of this game was incorrect. And it seems that the perhaps the impression of the person that left that review was also incorrect. They had a level of expectation that wasn't met. So that intrigued me because I wanted to know exactly what the game was at that point. I initially thought, okay, it's a sort of train management game, maybe like Train Fever Open TDD. But it's not. It isn't that at all. So I decided to dive in on it because I was intrigued. I wanted to know what it was. That's a key point because Train Valley is different. You know, if it was something like OpenTDD, I probably still would have played it, absolutely. But the fact that it wasn't actually got me even more interested to try and find out what it was. And in that case, I went into the game thinking, well, 
if there's a weird disconnect between what the players are thinking and what the game actually is, you know, their expectation versus the reality of the game, then that's something that I think would be great to explain in a video. So I went into it for that reason. And as it turned out, I thought it was really interesting. I was surprised that I actually enjoyed it, even though it wasn't what I'd initially expected it to be. So that's a sort of explanation as to why Train Valley got covered. You know, it did help, of course, that it was on the front page of Steam at that point. That always helps. If I can get a game while it's still under popular new releases, I will do that because it's better service to the game, it's better service to the consumer because they want to know what the latest is. And it's also good for me because I tend to get higher views on games that are on the front page of Steam versus those that are not. So there are practical reasons for that. Okay, let's move back to Mad Max. This should be a really obvious one. This is obviously also outside of the control of indie devs for the most part, although there's maybe a little piece of advice I can give on that. So Mad Max is a AAA title. Simple as that. It's one of two AAA titles that came out on the same day, one of those being Metal Gear Solid and the other one being Mad Max. Now, the reason I decided to cover Mad Max, not Metal Gear Solid, is simply because Mad Max is an easier game to get to grips with, and the problem with Metal Gear Solid is the game is freaking huge. And I have no experience with Metal Gear Solid at all. So for me, I decided, look, I'm going to go for Mad Max first because it's more practical. As a result, it probably means that I won't cover Metal Gear Solid. But frankly, by the time that I'd even got a reasonable grasp on that thing, I think my opinion would be past relevance. I know people would still watch the video, but I do like to create my videos as buyer's guides, and if everyone's already bought it, then there's really no point in doing that. I don't do critique for critique's sake. I'm not that sort of person. A lot of what drives the games that we choose to do is practicality and current relevance. One thing I will say about Mad Max is that I was definitely driven on to do the video, even though it was somewhat late, by the fact that there were mixed reviews and this dissonance between the opinions of the general consumer and the opinions of some critics. I found that interesting, and that made me more likely to go in and try and figure it out for myself. And honestly, Mad Max has done pretty well for us. I mean, we did three videos on it, which clocked in over a million views. That's a, that's a big success. So I am certainly happy to see that. But it's not really unexpected that I cover triple A's. I do when I get the opportunity to do so. There are some that I miss out on, which sucks, but that's just how things go. Okay, let's move back to Party Hard. So Party Hard, this is a title that got my attention as a result of how unique it is, of how different it is. It had a very interesting principle behind it. Now, this is, again, not a game I just stumbled upon. This is a title that one of the folks over at Tiny Build sent. Alex over at Tiny Build was promoting this game. And once again, what do we get? We get a pretty damn good email. In this case, the email <laughs> is headed up by a large gif of a dancing bear next to a clown. And immediately under that, my Steam key right there. So not only was that something that immediately caught my attention because of the goddamn dancing bear, but also the fact that it had the Steam key right there so I could dive right into it, which was fantastic. Really, really happy with that. They also pushed the idea that it had some Twitch live streaming functionality. So as a streamer, I obviously had a little bit more interest in that than I would in your average game. I'd also heard about it from Jesse Cox. And the thing is, Jesse Cox probably heard about it as a direct result of emails like that. So it's interesting to note how games can spread virally through a connection of YouTubers through things like podcasts, because of course we do pay attention to what other people are playing. And if we do see something interesting on somebody else's channel, we are perhaps more likely to also play it ourselves. So it's almost a case of trying to hit up YouTubers that are known to frequently collab with others, that are fairly well respected, and are watched actively by other YouTubers. You know, I have to wonder if that's the reason, or at least part of the reason, behind some of the lack of success of games that have been promoted by really big Let's Play channels, and yet don't seem to have really affected the sales all that much. I wonder if that's got something to do with it, because I'm going to be honest, 
I don't think there are all that many YouTubers that watch your big Let's Players like PewDiePie because usually we're much, much older than the audience that he's aiming for. We might pay attention to his channel because obviously he's a trendsetter and there are some channels that will deliberately ape what he's doing in order to try and ride on the coattails, but a lot of us just don't watch those channels. So we don't really hear about games that are coming through there. Whereas if they're played on perhaps a channel that we're more interested in that's more suited to the demographic that we ourselves are a part of, then we're more likely to pay attention to that sort of thing. I don't think, again, that's something you can really predict properly as a developer or a PR guy, but I just think it's a useful little factoid nonetheless. We're Understanding how a gamer finds out about a particular title is not that difficult, but understanding how a YouTuber finds out about a particular title, that's a little bit more complicated, and not something that I think has been investigated all that much. Just bear in mind that simply sending emails to YouTubers is absolutely no guarantee of coverage, it never will be. And more often than not, there are plenty of other factors that come into play when deciding which games we play. Now, Jesse Cox was definitely a factor in me playing Party Hard, because I'd heard him discuss it. The well-formulated PR email certainly helped, they made it a lot easier, so I didn't have to go and pursue the game, the key was right there and available to play that day, so that was great. But Jesse Cox is definitely a major factor there, and it's not the first time that that's happened. If I stumble across a game on somebody else's channel that I'm connected to or watch on a reasonably regular basis, I'm more likely to have a look at it. Are there any more examples of games recently that I've been more inclined to play as a result of coverage from other places? Guild of Dungeoneering is a good one because preview builds for that game were played by a number of people that I know. Now, I, I had a bit of intention of playing this, but I actually played the preview build and I didn't really get along with it. And I think the reason that I pushed on to do the video anyway, and I'm glad that I did, is because I saw other people playing it and maybe having a little bit more fun than I did. You know, my, my initial first impression of that game, the raw first impression, was not necessarily positive. But as a result of seeing coverage from other people, I was encouraged to put some more time into it and try and figure it out. Invisible Ink was another one that I was thinking about covering anyway because I'd done a really early PAX impression of it a number of years ago when it was still called Incognita. And I saw a number of other YouTubers giving it a shot and since it was in early access for a while and I was waiting for it to come out, that's maybe what pushed me over the edge there. So it can happen. It's not necessarily that common, at least for me, but I also have a feeling that... If I cover a game, there are definitely other channels that will also do that. You know, you see a bit of a crossover between Jesse Cox's Fan Friday stuff and the things that I do. And there's a reason for that, absolutely, because I know he pays attention to what I do and I pay attention to what he does. And of course, channels like Dodger also do the same thing. I think we both started kind of playing the swindle because it came up. I'm pretty sure I mentioned it and then she started playing it and then pl I played a bit more because she played a bit more and all that sort of thing. So maybe there is a piece of advice to be given there. Maybe when you're thinking exactly about who to market to, you should probably be looking at YouTubers that do regular collabs. You know, YouTubers are not standalone. They're often part of groups that will either play together or whose tastes are directly affected by each other. And learning who those little cliques are could be the difference between one person playing a game and three or four people playing a game. Anyway, moving on. So, The Flock. Why did I cover The Flock? This was about controversy. Controversy and an interesting idea. Standing out from the pack is something that we've talked about a great deal, and we talked about it with Airscape and how that game failed to stand out from the pack, even though it's a pretty decent game nonetheless. Now, The Flock is actually a bad game, but it's got a really interesting concept behind it. I didn't go into that thinking that it was going to be great. In fact, I went into it thinking the exact opposite. I wanted to know what the fuss was all about. I had heard about the planned obsolescence with that game, the limited number of lives. Yes, it's gimmicky, but it's unusual and I haven't really seen that done before, so I wanted to go in and try and figure out exactly what was going on. Did it help the flock? No. No, it didn't. Absolutely not. But it did get coverage. Now, it did get attention as a result, perhaps, of its failed design. There are channels that focus on playing a great deal of shovelware. Now, Jim Sterling's a prime example of that. He plays a lot of really bad games and mocks them, that's just his thing. I did that for a while, but I sort of started to shy away from it because I didn't really think it was our style. It wasn't really what our audience wanted, so I started looking towards other things. But 
The thing about the flock is the flock is not shovelware. You know? There are shovelware games which are just bad, and then there are bad games like the flock which are also interesting for some reason. Shovelware is not interesting. That's why I don't cover it. I don't find it interesting. I don't think that my audience finds it interesting. The flock, though, the concept is so intriguing that I had to give it a shot. I had to figure out, look, how did this game fall flat on its face? Was this idea as stupid as it sounded? Is there something here? Can this maybe affect the design of future games? It's interesting. It sucked, <laughs> but it was interesting. So that's why I ended up covering the flock as opposed to a million and one other bad games that we just end up ignoring. All right, moving on, Trine 3. This should be fairly obvious. I covered Trine 1 and 2. I love the series, that's why I covered Trine 3. Simple as that. I didn't cover it in Early Access because I don't cover Early Access games. There's nothing complicated about that choice. The Swindle. I think the reason for this one was actually because we had a little look at it during the release section of a co-optional podcast. It just happened to be something that caught my eye. Now, this is one of the cases where we actually went out of our way to request code, not the other way around. Most of the time, we just find code in our inbox. But if there's something that I'm really looking to cover right the hell now and we haven't received the code yet, Chris will go out of his way to actually go and ask for it. Now, the question is, why did I ask for it? It is probably down to the fact that we stumbled across this game during the co-optional release list. And every time we do co-optional, when we do releases, we always look for the thing on Steam. So in this case, the Steam page is what caught our eye. The aesthetic and the following line. The swindle is a steampunk cybercrime caper about breaking into buildings, hacking their systems, and stealing all their cash. Steampunk. Cybercrime. The name of the title. The Swindle. That sort of thing. The aesthetic that we saw immediately upon landing on the Steam page. These are all things that contributed to me wanting to get that game straight away. I, I was immediately curious about what this game was all about. The combination of steampunk and cybercrime sounds like an oxymoron. As a result, I was immediately interested. Now, when it came to playing the thing, you can note that my video came out on August the 15th, so we actually requested the code several weeks before the video came out. We requested the code on July the 27th. What exactly delayed me? Oh, well, there's God knows what reason for that. There's all sorts of things that would stop me from doing a video on that game immediately around that time. I was traveling. That's one of the big reasons. You know, we requested it on the 27th of July, but I was already in the UK at that point, so I didn't have the chance to play it. I eventually came back to it and got the video done. This is just one of those examples of a well-made Steam page that immediately caught our eye. In, when it comes to releases in particular, when we do the co-optional podcast, we skip through things so quickly because we simply don't have the time or really any information. We're just trying to recap all the releases before we leave the show. It's not a section we put a great deal of time into. So if something stops us and makes us say, ooh, that looks interesting, then I'm far more likely to have a look at it. So, well-made Steam page. Put your best foot forward. I need to know what the game is, and I need to know what the hook is. I need to be hooked immediately. This game hooked me on aesthetic. It hooked me on the idea of crime. All right, moving back, Oli Oli 2. Okay, so I'd already covered the previous version of this in Impress Me, or 15 Minutes of Game, if I recall correctly. And I also knew that Oli Oli was very successful on consoles. It was actually a fairly high-profile indie release, and this was the PC version of it. I had code prior to release for it, so I was just like, yeah, let's let's just do that. There wasn't really a lot more consideration in that other than the fact that I knew it was Oli Oli, it would be worthy of attention. So what about King's Quest? Well, that actually goes all the way back to the Game Awards in 2014. The section with Roberta Williams was the reason why I ended up looking at King's Quest. I had no idea what to expect going into it, but I was very intrigued, and I think there was an interesting story behind that. I wanted to know whether a revival of a venerated, if somewhat flawed, franchise would actually work if they were using, for the most part, modern game design techniques. It also helped that it was an episodic game. I'm much more confident doing first impressions on episodic stuff because the game itself is usually a lot shorter. In the case of all the Telltale stuff, I know that I can beat the episode in like two to three hours and then just make the video of it, and that's it. You know, I can do that in a day, no problem. Which is kind of great, honestly, because some games obviously take several days to really get to grips with. Telltale games, episodic games, 
they generally don't. So we have success with things like Life is Strange, Blues and Bullets, all the Telltale stuff and all that sort of thing. Game length is a factor in the decision to cover when you're very, very busy. YouTubers generally only have one person working on creating videos. There are some exceptions, but compared to traditional press outlets that have maybe 10 plus staff, different reviewers all working on different things, we can't spend a week looking at your game. There are too many other games. This is particularly true in our case because we try to cover as many games as possible and we use shorter formats to do it. They're not as accurate, of course. You know, we can't spend 40 hours on a game before creating a review. What we can do is do a first impressions. And I always feel more confident doing first impressions on shorter games because I am much, much more certain that I won't get things wrong. There's always a risk with first impressions. That's why I repeatedly disclaim the format and say, look, this is just a tool in the toolbox. Please use it alongside other information. Do not take this as gospel. I haven't finished the game. It's not a review. But a shorter game gives me a lot more confidence to go into that. And it's something I know that I can just pick up, do in a day, complete the video, and then move on to the next thing satisfied. So in the case of King's Quest, you had the interesting story behind it and the fact that it was episodic helped a lot. Blues and Bullets, same thing. In this case, though, it also hooked me in with a couple of little ideas. One, Blues and Bullets is noir. Unusual. Don't see a great deal of games using that particular aesthetic or committing to it as much as Blues and Bullets does. I like the noir aesthetic. I was intrigued. Looking at the screenshots, I thought to myself, ooh, this looks kind of pretty. And it did. Secondly, mature rated episodic game. Aren't all that many of those. Of course, prime example would be The Wolf Among Us, but outside of that, most episodic games are not stuck with such a high age rating. Obviously, my demographic, 25 to 34 male for the most part, they would be more interested in something like that. So there we go. And as we mentioned, episodic, but there was one other thing that really caught my eye, which was it has gunplay in it. It has shootouts. I was intrigued because most of these episodic games are built in the same way around the Telltale formula. Could they actually integrate other game mechanics effectively in an episodic adventure game? Not really. <laughs> As it turned out, no, it was very, very basic, but I wanted to discover that, and I did, and it wasn't exactly as good as I hoped, but it got me playing it, so the video came out. Victor Vran. This is an interesting case, because I think that this game could have very easily got lost in the shuffle. Has a very generic name, not helpful at all. Initial impressions say, this is an incredible Adventures of Van Helsing clone, if I were to just take a glance at it. So generic name seemed like a generic copy of something else. I was ready to skip it. I think the only reason that I didn't is because somebody on Facebook in the industry actually mentioned it and said, wow, this is actually quite good. That's a simple case of a recommendation from somebody I trust. I absolutely otherwise would have skipped that. They were actually kind of lucky in that regard. You know, what's also a little bit strange, despite the fact that I don't cover early access, the fact that this game was in early access actually helped me. It made me more likely to cover it. And you might ask why. It's simply due to the fact that the early access impressions of this game were very, very positive. You know, it had a lot of good ratings. So when I was prompted to have a look at it by somebody else that I knew, when I went to the Steam page, I saw lots of positive user reviews. I didn't actually read them. I just had a look at the number of positive reviews for the game on Steam. Why? Because it told me this game is probably worth my time. These days, with the number of games coming out on Steam, you will find that plenty of them don't have all that many user reviews. Unless the game is really, really, really bad and yet somehow had a way of attracting people to play it, you'll notice that a lot of titles are just ignored. Now, when a game has hundreds of positive ratings, that is a sign that it's at least worth taking a look at. Particularly when a game is in early access, it usually has to either be cashing in on some sort of trend like survival, or it has to be something genuinely interesting to a decent number of people. Getting people to buy into an action RPG on early access is actually kind of impressive, and it's not the sort of thing that I would have expected. So as a result of it being able to achieve that success, I was more interested to look at the final product, and I'm glad I did. Okay, let's do a few more and then talk about some general conclusions. Yasai Ninja. All right. Again, this came up during the podcast discussion. 
I had no idea what this was. I really didn't. It came out on a fairly slow day. The screenshots really confused me. <laughs> like, I was like, what is this? That what is with the broccoli and all that sort of thing? And you know, the weird thing was that the art style in the screenshots actually interested me. And then the game ended up being one of the worst games I've played all year. No doubt about that. But it's like, huh, all right, decent art style. Obviously, the screenshots were not really well representative of the game. A weird character. It's like, that. this is a broccoli ninja for some reason. And it has an afro. There are vegetables. Why are there vegetables? I was interested in knowing why there were vegetables. It's, it is that simple. And once I started playing it, it became abundantly clear that it was a special kind of bad. So I wanted to do the video on it at that point. We didn't get any PR about that. There are certain occasions when I'll stumble across something on Steam which is just so odd that I just can't help but look at it. Yes, I Ninja was one of those. Holy Potatoes Weapon Shop. Now, this is a similar principle, but in this case, we actually had a pretty decent game out of it. Couple of things about this. Great concept. Interesting concept. I liked Reketeer. I like the idea of management games set in fantasy worlds and all that sort of thing. I know that's super niche and strange, but I love that idea. And as a result, I had a look at it and I'm like, what is with this name? You know, it's the name that really attracted me initially. It's the least generic name that you could possibly think of, and it actually describes the game very well. It's got two hooks in the title. Holy Potatoes. Okay, I'm interested. I have no idea why you just said that. A weapon shop. Oh. So you're giving me the impression that something is a little bit strange, something odd is going on here that I should investigate, and it's a game about managing a weapon shop in some way. Really good descriptive title. Not in any way generic got my attention. And then, of course, once I look at the art style, it's like, what? I absolutely have to go into this, so... That's how Holy Potatoes succeeded. You'll recall perhaps a few tweets that I made before the game's release as I had a look at it. I'm like, wow, look at this, Holy Potatoes. July the 10th, I said, there is a game called Holy Potatoes, a weapon shop. I want to live the dream that it will be good. July the 11th, yay, Holy Potatoes code is here. I may be a little bit enthusiastic for this. It had no embargo on it, so I streamed it. Always nice, yeah? Little piece of advice. If you can justify it, make sure there's no streaming embargo on your game. If you want to put a review embargo on it, I understand that. That's fine. But it's often helpful not to have a streaming embargo. You can actually get double coverage that way from some people. If there's a game that people are interested in, there's a chance that I'll be able to get good stream numbers from it. I'll likely stream it before I make a full video of it. And Holy Potatoes did well for me. 384,000 views. Probably a lot of that comes from the unusual title. It's a similar principle to the reason why I got interested in the game in the first place, and viewers were interested in it because of its weird title. So that helped, and as a result, I had some success with the stream as well. And from a business standpoint, that's really sensible. You know, I like to diversify my revenue, as should anybody. I don't like to rely on one source, so I do a decent amount of streaming, and generally speaking, it'll do well if I stream something with an unusual title that's kind of interesting to people. So, in the case of Holy Potatoes, that game was unusual, it was a little bit gimmicky, it had a weird title, it resonated well with the audience, and it got me interested. It was just kind of a perfect storm there, I think. And I do like that sort of genre as well, so it seemed to work out well. Okay, a couple more, since this video is starting to run on quite long. Guild of Dungeoneering. As I said, I got preview version for that. The reason I was probably pushed to play more of it was as a result of my friends playing it. You know, Jesse Cox and Dodger were playing preview builds and a few other channels were as well. So I'm like, okay, I should do the video on the full thing. And this game had a reasonable amount of show hype from places like PAX and all that sort of thing. I'd heard about it prior to this as a result. And having a look at the graphic style, I was intrigued by the aesthetic. If you go to Guild of Dungeoneering, it has a couple of little hooks again on the Steam page. One of them is the aesthetic, and the other one is you build the dungeon around him. Again, this is something that I didn't quite get, like I had the wrong impression of, but because I like games like Dungeon Keeper, I thought immediately, oh, you get to build the dungeon, that sounds great, and all that sort of thing. Of course, that really isn't what the game is at all, but it helped hook me in regardless. And as a result, I ended up playing more of the game than I perhaps would have expected, and eventually I ended up quite enjoying it. I have a few issues with that game, but I thought it was pretty good. Also, I might note that as soon as I opened that game, I was immediately hooked in. Why? 
because of the opening menu song. I know, that's weird, isn't it? Now, that's a 30 FPS game that I was like, oh god, 30 FPS. And then I heard the singing. <laughs> I was like, ah, this game has a sense of humor. This game has a very unique character to it. That kept me playing. That hooked me in immediately. I know they say don't judge a book by its cover, but you would be surprised at how effective a good cover is. In the case of Guild of Dungeoneering, it was that damn opening menu song, the little ballad from the minstrel. Get your hooks into the player ASAP. Make sure they don't turn off the game. I install a lot more games than I ever end up playing on the channel, and there are many things which will actually put me off immediately. And I know this sounds unprofessional, but because of the number of games I have, if your game puts a significant obstacle in front of me, or doesn't get its hooks into me pretty quickly, the chances are I'll pass it over and look at something else. Unless I know that this game's kind of a big deal. Now, I'll often persist with big name indies or with AAAs, for obvious reasons, because a lot of people want to know about them. But there are plenty of factors that will immediately make me stop playing. Here's a good example, yeah? And I'll probably go back and look at this game again. It's not that immediately putting me off will mean that I'll never look at your game again. But it can depend. Like, maybe I'm in a rush that day. If, if a game just throws obstacles in front of me, I'll say, screw it, I'm going to go do something else today. The recent example of that is Sky Shines Bedlam. Now, I wanted to have a look at this because the Steam description seemed intriguing. It was sort of right up my alley. It's like, hey, okay, it's a strategic roguelike tactical combat. You've got this big armored moving fortress and all that sort of thing. I loaded up the game and it got me into combat after not explaining anything. And I couldn't figure the UI out immediately. Like the UI didn't make a great deal of sense. And as a result, I actually just turned the game off. I'll probably go back to it, but... I was like, whoa, where's the tutorial? What's going on here? Like, why is it that the sort of intuitive controls that I would expect? It's like, okay, I'm going to left click on this and then right click on this. Why can't I attack this thing? I don't know. The game's giving me no feedback. All F4. Go on to something else. I will probably revisit it. But that shouldn't have happened. Now, this is a genre that I enjoy. The aesthetic looked pretty good. So I should have been able to get into it. And I didn't. Because of that, there was an early stumbling block. For the love of God, never, ever, ever do that. Never place a barrier to entry in any way. Make sure there's a decent tutorial, for God's sake, unless your game is super intuitive. But yeah, I need to go back and look at that one, but that's the reason I didn't look at it earlier. Because of that early stumbling block. Okay, one more Coffin Dodgers. Was there a good reason to cover this game? No. Absolutely not. But I did it anyway because I was in a hurry that day and I needed something for the channel. That simple. That game did not market itself well to us. There was nothing really special about it. I simply played it because I needed content that day. And it's not that difficult to get to grips with a cart racer. That's just the reality sometimes. Sometimes I'm having a busy day, I know I need content for the channel tomorrow, so I jump on a game that looks pretty easy to get the hang of. Simple as that. That's Coffin Dodgers. Didn't turn out to be all that good. Okay, yeah, so that's a run back through about 13 or 14 of the recent WTFAs. So what kind of conclusions can we actually draw from that? Firstly, for the love of God, do your PR properly. Here's a few quotes from Christian. I asked him earlier, look, what do you think is a good PR email and what do you think is a bad one? Because, of course, he is filtering a lot of this stuff out for me. Starting with the bad ones, he said, a bad PR email comes from somebody that doesn't take into account the outlet that they're sending to, aka saying that you can post the screenshots in your article. Those with a visible BCC tag, spelling mistakes, or that make you jump through hoops to actually get the key. These are all absolutely right. Sending us screenshots, sending us trailers, sending us generic press releases. We don't care. We're a YouTube channel. We don't post that stuff. We've never posted that stuff. Vast majority of YouTube channels do not cover that. Don't do it. Don't send YouTubers generic press releases intended for games websites. We don't cover that stuff. We're going to ignore you. We want games, preferably that we can play right the hell now and that are interesting. Now, when I asked Chris what he was looking for in a good email, he said, Technical data upfront, detailed embargo info in the first half of the email that includes a key without having to reply. 
again, a big deal. That was kind of what I was talking about earlier. Front load the message. I want to know what the game is, why I should care, and how to install it right the hell now within the first few lines of the email. Everything else is unimportant. I don't care how many awards you've got. I don't really follow that scene. I don't think, honestly, a lot of consumers follow that scene, especially when it comes to indies. I don't care what coverage from other places is said because I am doing my own. I try not to be affected by what other people say in this particular industry. Make me care. Make me want to play your game. That is the core aspect of it. And it seems extremely obvious when you think about it. It's like, wow, you took 40 minutes to say that? Sure. Absolutely. But it goes back to the video that I made a week or so ago, the failure of an indie platformer when talking about Airscape. There are so many games that just don't get the YouTuber or the website to care about covering them. Airscape has no hook. It's good, but it doesn't have a hook. Nothing to really get me into it. The only reason I covered it was because nobody covered it, and that became a big deal. Its lack of coverage actually became news, and then I covered it, although perhaps not in the way that they would have liked. It might suck to hear this, but as a developer, your artistic vision is not necessarily something that anybody outside of your office shares. You have to convince them of that, and the way that you usually do that is by making your game stand out from the pack, and if you are in a crowded genre, you need to do something serious to stand out from the pack. If you are in the genre of indie puzzle platformer, my god, you better have an interesting title. You better have a really intriguing aesthetic. You would better have a super cool mechanic, and you better front load your information with that immediately. There's a concept that rarely gets brought up, and it's a concept for the most part from board games, and that's the idea of theme. Board games are a little bit different to regular video games. However, there is a surprising amount of similarity in the way that they are designed and iterated upon. Board games have something called rethemes. Now, rethemes are the idea of taking an existing set of mechanics and changing the theme of the game, changing the setting. An example of this is a game called Imperial Assault. It is a Star Wars dungeon crawling board game. It is considered a retheme of a popular dungeon crawler called Descent. Now, Descent is a good game, but I am not so interested in playing it because, hey, it's a fantasy dungeon crawler. A Star Wars dungeon crawler, on the other hand, now that I'm interested in. And as a result, it's done very well because, of course, a lot of other people are very interested in that. There are some games that live or die based on re-themes. The popularity of Munchkin is a great example. They have done all sorts of different re-themes and they've worked with different creators. And each time they do that, they expose Munchkin to a new audience that is not necessarily interested in Munchkin, but they're interested in a game that has a theme that they care about. Now, Love Letter, which is a very popular sort of intro game, very quick game, has been rethemed multiple times. There's a Batman Arkham version of it. There is an Adventure Time version of Love Letter. Now, why am I even mentioning this? Why does this even come up? Because theme matters a huge amount. You remember what I was talking about with Swindle? The theme is what got me playing in the first place. Cyber Crime Steampunk, what is that? I am too interested in having a look at that sort of thing. I'm a sucker for Warhammer 40,000. I'll buy a 40k retheme of pretty much anything, whether it be a board game or a video game. A lot of them suck, but I'll buy them anyway because I love 40k that damn much. It can really sting to hear that because, of course, a lot of developers want to develop their own original ideas and IP. But I don't think there's a shadow of a doubt when I say it will help your game immensely if it happens to be themed in an interesting way. I think Airscape is a great example of a game that basically has no theme at all. What's with the octopus? Why is there an octopus? Why are we playing this game with an octopus? That game basically has no theme at all. It has no aesthetic really to tie it together. And yet many of the games that I've talked about that I have covered over the past few months that I've been interested in covering are as a result of something standing out to me. And it's more often than not something to do with the theme. Either a key mechanic that is unusual and attractive to me, or the overall theme, aesthetic, and setting for the game. I'm more likely to cover your Star Trek puzzle platformer than I would a regular puzzle platformer. I'm more likely to cover your cyberpunk puzzle game than I am a regular run-of-the-mill puzzle game. This is obviously going to vary from person to person, but never ignore the importance of that sort of hook. There is a reason that there is a cyberpunk tag on Steam. You can search by cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is not a game genre. It's a setting. It's a theme. 
Post-apocalyptic is a theme. Sci-fi is a theme. It's as the Airscape developer said, making a good game is simply not good enough anymore. Hopefully that was in some way useful. I don't know how really insightful that is because my process is obviously going to be different to pretty much everybody else's. The focus of my channel is different to many people. There's going to be a difference between the games that I choose to cover versus the games that, say, Let's Players choose to look at. There are many different factors involved in choosing those titles. But what's important to know is that there are factors. There was a recent article on Steam Spy that said, your target audience doesn't exist. To some degree, I would disagree with that overall statement. The article was referring to groups like, say, MOBA players and core gamers and MMO players and so on and so forth. And it very well might be true in that regard, but there absolutely is a target audience for specific themes, and that's something that people can tap into. Understanding exactly who you're aiming at is a big deal. You can't simply throw a game out and expect it to find its audience on its own. You need to have an idea of the sort of person that would enjoy it, and you need to figure out exactly why they would enjoy it and why they would even give it a look in the first place. YouTubers and streamers and indeed gamers want to care about games. They do, they're enthusiasts, there's no doubt. You have to make them care about yours. There is no surefire way of doing that with every single person. But perhaps that went some way to explaining exactly how it works with me. My name's been Total Biscuit, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.